Uh, I'm going to entitle um, Optics. Um, but it's actually something that I've been working on since last October and uh, it's quite different from what I usually do. I'm mainly a video artist. So um, this is something, um, besides I, only, uh, I also do some sound work and in fact it's also my second time here at Stein. Uh, this project uh, is based on a technology that I um, assume that lots of sound artists would know already, but actually the more I ask around it, the more I realize that it's uh, a, a technology that only radio amateurs seem to practice. And it's called uh, EME, uh, Earth, Moon, Earth, which, uh, as the title suggests, is the uh, communication between the Earth and the Moon by radio signals. And um, I was researching on this technology um, not a long time ago, and um, I found lots of uh, websites on the Internet of... Uh, radio amateurs all, all over the world uh, who use this uh, way of uh, communicating of, instead of just using the phone or modern technology. So I got really interested in, in it and, um, and uh, I, um, I just had this idea of uh, using uh, this technology for sending not uh, only sound but also images which I assumed also would be something quite um, now well known. So I got in touch with uh, some radio amateurs in uh, Dwingelo which is a, a remote location in the northeast of um, Holland and uh, they were they, they replied very enthusiastically because they never thought about doing such a thing. So actually, apparently, it's never been done before in the whole history. So I was really shocked by this uh, uh, reaction. And uh, we started immediately working on a project um, together. Initially, uh, the idea I had was to send images um, uh, about the Cold War because the EME technology was mainly using uh, used during those times for uh, as an espionage technique um, and in fact it was uh, it just started after the second world war and um, uh, it, it was used by the military service for um, detecting 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 signals coming from eastern europe um, and uh, yeah, the Russian uh, in Russia, and um, um, and the very first attempt they made to uh, have a moon uh, have a, a moon bounce was in 1954. So that's when they actually real, uh, managed to um, uh, send a radio signals from one part of uh, the Earth to another part of the Earth by the moon which acts as a sort of passive satellite. So it's actually the very first satellite that men used. And it was uh, really important because it, uh, it opened up the possibilities for artificial satellite to, to happen. So um, it's actually quite uh, groundbreaking, groundbreaking technology. Um, so in a way, what I'm trying to do is uh, using the um, the moon as a natural satellite to send uh, image files uh, instead of using the internet. Uh, I mean, using the internet, but not as a, um, uh, not through the artificial satellite, but as a uh, thanks to the natural satellite, which is the moon. Um, I'm just showing some experiments that we've been doing um, at Dwingelo. Um, Basically, the, the way we work is that we send these uh, images from Dwingelo Radio Telescope and uh, we receive them back in uh, Brazil and then they are sent back to me in uh, wherever location I am and uh, the project will be about having this live uh, transmission with the moon. Um, so projecting the images while they get uh, scanned in uh, real time. So. Uh, for each image to actually uh, come back and be uh, reproduced uh, in the gallery space will take about two minutes. Um, okay, I'll just show you some of the attempts that we made. Um, so. Um, so. 
Okay, I think this was the very first picture that, uh, oh no, okay, um, the one before. Ah, too quick. Okay. Um, yeah, this was the very first picture that was sent to the moon, so it's um, probably quite, um, yeah, very, the signal wasn't very good uh, in that occasion. Um, this is also part of the very first experiments that we did. And so does this one. Um, but again, I'm really interested in the use of these colors. Um, and in fact, I will tell you more about the project in a minute. At some point, we started getting um, better signals, like in this one. Uh, something showing up in here, and uh, this was obviously an Im image that uh, is already quite recognizable. Um, yeah, with numbers, it seems to be better. This is the image of, of the astronauts when they came back from the moon after the moon landing. Maybe it's vaguely recognizable. Um, another image. I don't know what that is. <laughs> um, this is quite good. <coughs> okay, there should be also. Okay, no. Okay, this is probably the best one that we got so far, where you can actually see something showing. But um, we are trying to practice. Uh, more for getting better signals and also this type of uh, uh, technology is best uh, only in a very short time during the month because uh, of the position of the moon in relation to the earth so I think the actual time when you can practice with this technology is only about two days uh, in, in a month and also you need to consider that if you are sending uh, sound or image from one part of the earth to another part of the earth you need to have the moon visible in both places. So it's sometimes it's a very narrow time uh, during the day when you can actually do this. But these uh, radio amateurs are actually very active and uh, their, uh, their, their work is really not high tech as one might, might think. And uh, most people uh, build their own small dish uh, in the back garden and there is on the internet lots of information about how to build your own dish and how to start communicating with the moon. But obviously the smaller the dish is, the uh, less good the signal will be. So uh, initially you may just get some really noisy background, um, um, yeah, <coughs> some background noise. But I would like to play some, uh, just a very short video that the radio amateurs are doing in Usaini. And uh, here you can see someone singing at the moon. And uh, um, yeah, just very short video. This is uh, doing a lot, a very telescope. <coughs> I didn't know this, but uh, in some places uh, all over the world, they have uh, every year a small festival where they, where they sing this uh, type of song. So um, mostly children uh, show up and they start singing and uh, they get this eco back from the moon. So it's been around for ages and it's not at all well known. But um, 
this uh, project that I'm working on, uh, as I mentioned before, is called Optics, and um, its name is borrowed from this, um, well, uh, Newton's theory, um, according to which each color of the spectrum is related to a musical note of the octave, and, uh, and they have uh, a hidden relationship with the celestial bodies. So um, uh, I just uh, thought of using the seven colors of the spectrum, which will be sent um, via uh, Dwingelu radio telescope to Brazil uh, using the moon as a satellite. So just the seven colors of the spectrum. And while they get uh, received back and scanned uh, as a projection, uh, I will also play some sound that has been realized by a sound artist with, who is also uh, taking part in this collaborative project. And um, his name is Eric Thomas, and he made a composition uh, especially for EME, which is something also, I think, quite uh, unique because uh, all the mu music that has been used with EME uh, has been somehow, was already pre-existing music or, yeah, random noise or random songs and nobody actually has done a composition oppositely for this technology. So um, I'm going to play... Uh, this short composition, which is based on the idea of the octave, so trying to keep it as uh, minimalist as possible. And I think it's done a really interesting piece of music. seven minutes composition because each um, each note is kept for one minute uh, because that is the time needed for the picture to load up completely and to show uh, fully in the projection because the way we receive the image is uh, uh, through a scanning television so it will just show uh, line by line until the complete picture. So it's seven uh, minutes of um, with the seven different notes, basically. And um, yeah, I think that's uh, more or less that's about it. Yes. I've got a couple of websites that might be interesting for you to look on uh, for this type of technology. Uh, one which I find very interesting is called bhfdx.info. I can tell you later if you want. Or another one is uh, ecosofapollo.com, and you can find lots of information about um, radio amateurs or how to build your own dish or how to start this type of uh, radio uh, yeah, sound um, experiments. And yes, any questions? Anybody? Yeah, the visual images I'm seeing uh, are essentially reassembled scan line scanline images sent one scanline at a time, right? Yeah. So the um, so the, the noise in the image that I'm seeing is atmospheric scattering on transmission and reception both? Um, okay, uh, yeah, no, it's a bit confusing. Okay, uh, the images, um, sorry, sorry, you are talking about... <laughs> uh, noise really interests me, and these are interesting noisy images. Uh, you're talking, sorry, about the uh, images, of course, that yes, we saw before. Right. Okay. Um, yes, they are received as a sound, and mm -hmm. we reconvert them into image uh, through a software. 
but uh, yeah, they are sent by the radio telescope as a sound. They bounce back, and obviously the signal, because of the bouncing, gets a bit weaker. So by the time the other radio telescope in Brazil receive it back, then it's obviously uh, you've lost much of the clarity of the picture. But um, is that what you're saying? Or yeah. Not? I guess so. I guess my question is if. Uh, the noise, the noise in the image alters. So is what I'm seeing for the alteration, the signal being perturbed by the atmospheric la layer through which it passes? Um, or is what I'm seeing an artifact of things like rotate, the rotational geometry of the place that's sending and the place that's receiving? No, actually, the atmospheric, uh, the, the atmosphere has not no, no, no. influenced no me this kind of, no. Not even off the troposphere. Not at all. In fact, uh, this is why in the f uh, late 40s it was a, such a revolutionary technology because it was the first time that they managed to send uh, a radio signals that uh, was, was not affected at all by the ionospheric atmosphere. Mm -hmm. and, uh, what kind of wavelengths are we talking about? Oh well, I've got something. I, I'm not. I have to say, the radio amateurs are the real big uh, people in technology in this aspect. But I, um, okay, I have some notes here uh, from approximately 400 to, to 2,100 uh, hertz. So I don't know if that helps at all. Is that wrong? Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, but I think the reason why we perceive the image is so disturbed is because of the fact that the signal travels long way. So uh, by the time it gets back, uh, it's obviously uh, much weaker. And also, you will need a very big dish to get a really big quality. Uh, so, the, so the size um, of the dish has something to do with... Yes, I mean, we are using a 25-meter dish, uh, which is rel relatively big, but... Um, uh, obviously, you would need to use better dishes to get also better quality on the image. Um, and also in the sound, that is very evident. Um, now, we haven't tried yet to send the sound that you have just played mm -hmm. to the moon, but I think when we will receive it back, it will sound in a completely different way. So we still have to, to see what happens. Um, any more questions? Or? How do you make an image of the um, oh, I, I think it's all to do with softwares that I don't use personally. Uh, the radio amateurs do this for me. So um, they know all the softwares that can trans transform a JPEG image into sound. So it's, so it's, JPEG. it's a JPEG, yeah. It's the only format that they actually use. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, why? Okay. Uh, that tells me something about how they're doing the encoding. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, then. Good. Well, uh, yes, they only use JPEGs. Coming to Hot Pot Lab number five. This is our uh, monthly uh, experimental music information entertainment event. Um, this, theme, this, this month's theme was all the things you wanted to know about. And I'm sure you guys were dying to know about um, EME, EME and Kathy Matthews and, and also about how to deal with crashes during a performance. Um, so I thought I'll dig into some of the, um, uh, the archives of Stein and looking at how musicians deal with uh, sort of um, problems during a performance. And most of you know that you know, computer musicians are one of the most neurotic people in the world. And uh, there's a reason for that, because we're dealing with sort of new instruments. And uh, I'm sure when the piano was first invented, there was also all these uncertainties and all that. And over time, it got uh, more stable and secure. But in our field, we're trying to do the best to design our tools and make it stable as possible. And especially, that's what we've been doing at Stein. But still, you know, stuff happen, happens. And um, 
when it happens on stage, unfortunately, it's up to the performer to deal with it. And um, interesting enough, the, the artists that we really like are the people who have, we've seen crashes on performance and who've dealt it uh, really well. And um, I hope I don't psych the guys out who are performing next. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I don't jinx them. But uh, I thought first, rather than sort of embarrassing other people, I thought I'd embarrass myself first. Um, so I'll show you a clip from a performance I did uh, last year in 2009 in Minnesota at the Spark <coughs> Festival. And uh, this was uh, a really large crowd. Um, it was about 300 people, uh, 300, 400 people in a the theater. And I was doing my thing, but then in soundcheck I noticed that my uh, USB controller was dropping out once in a while. And uh, since this was happening, I thought there's a possibility of that it could crash. Um, and my performance is totally dependent on what I do with my controller. So I'll show you a clip. Um, the video is really dark. So I'm doing my thing right there. And usually I have my computer closed and I darken the screen, but this time since there was this possibility of crashing, I left it open. into my performance. Right there. <laughs> I looked up at the audience, so things weren't happening, and um, I had to check if the audience noticed it. They didn't. So what I'm doing now next is I'm unplugging the USB cable, plugging it back in. In my Max patch, I'm hitting the uh, search for device and reconnect. Um, <laughs> My, my device is reconnecting again right there. <laughs> and I try to play it off. Right? <laughs> so it comes back after this, but then a minute later when I change the next record, uh, of course it happens again. Fast forward a bit. Twice, the crash happened twice during the first two minutes of the performance, and the second time, I am actually managed to scratch the record and then um, unplug. So I actually developed a new technique called the one-hand scratch, one-hand plug in the USB switch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the second time, I was, I was you know, relatively prepared, and I thought, okay, this is how the performance is going to be, so I kind of switched my modes. And after that, for the rest of the uh, 50 minutes, so it didn't happen, so I was lucky. Uh, the second example is Alex Novitz. Um, Alex is somebody uh, who samples his voice uh, with two Wii controllers. And um, this is a performance from 2008. Let's see if you guys know where it's from.
right there, he's checking his computer. <laughs> On the side. He's like, that, so that's his oh shit face. Uh, but he's, he's glancing, right? He's not stopping his performance. So there he actually ends his piece, and then he goes to his computer, he fits his Wii controllers, and he bows, waits for the clap, and then he reconnects his device. And what's impressive is that the second half part of the, the performance, he actually uses this for his advantage. <laughs> In the last part of the performance, he actually plays with the notion that the controller falls out and even does these very sort of dramatic, I mean, I've, never, I've seen him so many times, he's never spun like that before. <laughs> um, but definitely sort of the switching of mode and then dealing with the situation is, is, is sort of brilliant in a way. Um, but these are relatively sort of cute crashes. Um, you know, sometimes your computer just totally stops. and. Uh, Another uh, example of that is actually the same night um, by Roll Up Cowboy. Um, and so let's just watch what happens. literally like two minutes in the performance. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so he, you can't see it, but he has this shit, <laughs> oh shit face on right now. Um, and uh, I mean, we're laughing right now, but if you're a performer and you know you're on stage and this happens, you're just, so many things are going through your mind. Um, so the, so the, so most, <laughs> <laughs> so actually, most of the performance was was uh, was this. Is there a bunch of right shit right here? <laughs> oh really? And so now you reboot and, you, and everything was going well for about 10 minutes. So his performance was, was um, went on. Let's just skip through a bit. Um, and so he was entering his next track. So that was kind of his setup, build up track, and then he had his sort of more, you know, upbeat track coming up.
point, you can't really do much after the second crash, but still, it was a, it was a performance. It was about him dealing with the situation and, you know, with the technology, and the audience sort of went home with, with the show. It wasn't about, I mean, the debugging part was, became the, the performance. And, you know, both Alex and uh, Robot Cowboy are two artists that we still support, and we think they're great performers, and actually, you know, seeing how they deal with this um, almost gave, gave us confidence that um, it is worth working with them um, hand in hand. Um, so some lessons. Um, diversify your output. So in my case and Alex's case, uh, we both have the computer sound and another analog-based sound. So in my case, I have a turntable. The turntable is just coming raw output. So even if the computer crashes, I can still play the turntable. Alex has the voice. And uh, this is actually a good way to um, just have different audio streams. And if one goes bad, you have the other one. The other one is know your bugs. Um, and it, it, it really makes a difference if you know what could go wrong and when, uh, what, are the, what are the possible faults. And when it happens, you know how to deal with it, you're prepared. And I think the only way you could really deal with this is rehearsing and practicing. So then the computer does become like a traditional instrument. You really have to practice and learn your instrument. Uh, make it part of your performance. Make it seem like it's intentional. Um, yeah, the, the show has to go on. And this is something we really push at Stein, is that, yeah, we're not going to let anybody say, sorry, 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 we're gonna, I'm going to restart my computer. No, it has to be, you know, you have to deal with it. Uh, and then <clears throat> pray to the performance god. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm not religious, but I think if you're, you know, if you keep good behavior and you're a good, good, good musician, then the performance god, god will come back uh, to you during the performance. And like in my case, after I dealt with two crashes, um, he came back and I didn't crash for 20 minutes. Um, so that's it for my phone, for my presentation. <laughs> Preservation of 
of uh, works for uh, acoustics and electronics. At, I'm sorry, for the MIT Greek Time Music Interaction. So that makes for the MIT researchers and developers. And of course, we work on all sorts of projects, <coughs> funding from the EU and national research projects and industry projects. Then we have the mediation department that takes care of uh, contact with the outside world through the software user group forum. And <coughs> that is kind of reorganizing constantly. And the mediation department that takes care of the research components. And since last year, an open <coughs> call for residency, for residency program, which will be conducted next year also. And we've got everything we need for public relations and the multimedia library, which is very nice. And the swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> Was it already there? That's what we just built this thing. <laughs> Actually, when it was built, this, this, that square was pretty empty. And uh, John Fumigo, the president, walked over and said, hey, I think this is a bit empty. Let's have something there. <laughs> so they asked, if you get some fans, and John can you make this? And it's a Stravinsky found it. So that's the concept of the variable acoustics, where you can travel these surfaces and lower the ceiling also and this is actually a peek at the new wave field synthesis system on a little sound field construction. A little anchoric chamber, not as big as the one in Liverson, only half the size. And finally let's go into our team. So the real-time music interaction with Norbert Schnell, the founder of the team in its current form, and now Fred Bigelatva is the head of the team, you know, working for them. And our context is, of course, always the, 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 the European music of uh, acoustic electronics with acoustic musicians and sound being, being processed and, and played back as part of the concert. However, we are more and more adding capture of image or gesture in general that will be added and followed and recognized and classified to, to actually augment the, the audio process we can do. So all this is interactive, sounds and effects, more detail, reduced score flowing, uh, content-based processing, Across the synthesis and on the gesture movement recognition side, we work on gesture capture systems, the hardware, also the modeling of multimodal input data, and all this to create interactive systems for performing arts and installations. So the concepts are always human computer interaction, interaction with digital media, or actually. We prefer to see it as the human interaction that is mediated by computers. Finally, it's always musicians on stage that interact or with themselves or with the audience. Which was just a tool. I should have no question. And so finally from performing arts, of course, there's always a pedagogical aspect we can take out of that. With this expressive control of digital media and our work on, on the new interfaces type for music expression. And what is great nowadays is that actually everyone has in his pocket already an interface for gesture capture, which is all these the cell phones that have accelerometers. And this is more and more exploited in the interesting research part to touch the general public. And all the, the interaction we have been working on for music is now very much going into the mainstream in creative stuff and games. Oh, let's skip over this slide and we'll do any projects. I'm going to bore you with all these acronyms. But let's go really into, into the, some of the topics with some examples. So, one of the first research topics in the team was the all the idea of score falling. So 
adding position, the usual way of adding the electronics part to the acoustic part was the tape. Because that is very boring for the musician because the tape would just play disturbing the uh, stuff. So nowadays we prefer this to be an interactive system that produces the, the electronic part. And the musician has a score, and the computer has also a representation of that score, and also some ear. And so the synchronization can be really on the musician, which gives the musician with the choice of, uh, of the interpretation of, of time. And okay, just one little excerpt of the current scoffering system by Asia Kant. Measurements, you can pretty much tell 
this got to detaché or not to leave. And that was used by Jean Vachy in the piece to actually uh, control different uh, 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 different effects on the transformations on, on the sun. So just a short example. using the, the actual segments of the chord itself. So you get, you get all the texture. And all these, these, these huge statements of sound, everyone has this already in their computer. Our new method and allows to create new type of sounds. And my 
I have heard about speech synthesis, which is always concatenative. And there's also a link to granular synthesis, which some of you might know. However, we can do more than just scan around in a sound <coughs> by, by position. We can actually pick the grains that sound the way we want them to. And here comes in that, that little software I've been working on the last time, it's called Qatar. And this also can be downloaded for free on our team's website, IMTR. And it will be, become clearer with the demo. So this is a crop of sound. You can see each one of these, these little dots is one snippet of sound. However, it is displayed here according to its brilliance here on the x-axis and its periods. And now to, to play with that, I just need to move, to move around in this very simple 2D interface. And that's it. They sound so That's how you see where you can actually make your own trajectories through all these source sounds that allow you to recombine the to recontextualize the content of your corpus and it makes this accessible to, to a composition, the composition of this content in real time or offline. Okay. So this is also used in, in many projects in sound design and composition, for example, some installations or in live electroacoustic music. So, uh, one example was by some video on C.C. Babiol who turned photocopiers into musical instruments by placing a mic on the inside and then composing a piece, having, well, having the, the machine compose a piece from the recording people made in that installation, from the, the, copy, the copy action that people made. Um, one other installation where Katar played a tiny little role was, was rain stick, where he used this the rain stick metaphor and motion capture. So people would have uh, actually two wheels with motion capture and they would kind of have a virtual rain stick in their bands of, of the wheels and would make it rain from, from one side to the other. And the idea here was that the sound was actually composed by my Kelly and offered several levels of percussion. They have very, very often used for all percussion. They have more subtle.
this is really inciting people to to learn this kind of instrument. And after a few minutes, you really start getting into it, and really you're not interacting with the sound installation anymore, but you're really playing it. Let me show you just some examples of the public.